Hi everybody, it's Wesley with 22 Zines. I had a request to do this video, and it's something that I've been thinking about doing for a long time anyway, and on the topic of astrological associations with the tarot. Uh, I'll just say really quick right now, this is going to be not a very video e video. Um, so if you want to click away and listen to this as audio, you probably won't miss much. I'm just going to have this little uh, stack of majors here to uh, let you know <laughs> which which card we're going to be talking about. Um, okay, so a little bit of backstory. I came over to the tarot from astrology, and I really like how astrological signs and planets can be associated with the tarot but a few parts of the traditional structure of astrological associations, um, the ones that were made and popularized by the Golden Dawn, don't quite land with me. <laughs> um, so I've worked out some alternative associations that I like better, and I'm pretty proud, honestly, because I think that this makes for an overall more elegant system that's a lot more in line with the way that I approach astrology and the way that I approach tarot. So what I'm going to do here is talk a little bit about why I want to make these changes at all, and then I'm going to go through each card and talk about the change that I would make. Uh, in this video, I'm only going to talk about the majors, and I'm only going to go in depth on the cards where I differ from the Golden Dawn associations, because otherwise we would just be here forever, and you'll see exactly what I mean in a minute here. Um, I have thoroughly considered each card, um, and finally, I feel like... I've come up with a system I'm pretty happy with by changing the associations of six of the cards. Which six you'll have to watch to find out, or just check the chapter titles. <laughs> um, so I'll have a chapter uh, highlighting each of the cards that I would change. So, um, first, just a few notes on general changes. I have a lot of notes here. Um, so, I fully admit that my first problem with the traditional Golden Dawn system of astrological associations is that it felt kind of clunky, for lack of a better word. The main three things that they associate with the Major Arcana are the twelve signs, the seven traditional planets, and three of the four elements we see in the minors. Why only three? Um, because if there were four, then they'd have 23 astrological archetypes, which is one too many for the major arcana. The element that's usually left out, um, or always left out with Golden Dawn systems, is Elemental Earth. Uh, or sometimes Elemental Earth is assigned to the world card alongside Saturn. And that's always kind of annoyed me, because it seemed like such an obvious imperfection. And as I was researching more for this video. I learned why they only use three elements and why Earth in particular was left out, and frankly it's something I should have been able to guess earlier. <laughs> it's because the astrological associations used by the Golden Dawn are mediated by the Hebrew letters in the Kabbalah. Of course. <laughs> the general story told in Kabbalistic mysticism is that God brought certain things into being by speaking the numbers 1 through 10 and each of the Hebrew letters. Um, the probably most defining text is called the Sefer Yetzirah, and I've included a link to the Wikipedia page for the text, which explains a lot of stuff really well. The Sefer Yetzirah uh, splits the Hebrew letters into one group of three, one of seven, and one of twelve. The three, the group of three of the Hebrew letters represents the elements um, for whatever reason, the Sefer Yetzirah recognizes only three primordial elements from which everything was created, as opposed to the four that we're used to seeing from the Greeks and other facets of Western occultism and philosophy and all that sort of thing. Um, so the Sefer's primordial elements are air, which is like God's breath and formed air or space in the universe, water, which formed earth, and fire, which formed heaven. And the elements that they use have a million other associations too, but that is why there are only three and not four, is because they do not recognize um, four primordial elements. They they have three in their form of mis uh, their form of uh, yeah their form of mysticism. Now, I don't know enough about why the twenty two Hebrew letters were split into three, seven, and twelve whether that was done deliberately to correspond with the three elements, planets, and zodiac, or whether it was done for some other internal reason and the connections 
with astrology were secondary. But the point is that the Golden Dawn liked the Kabbalah a lot. And when the Golden Dawn associated astrological symbolism with the tarot cards, they did not come up with the astrological associations themselves, but did so through the Kabbalistic meanings of the Hebrew letters. So the connections are mediated by the Kabbalah in the sense that um, it, there were pre-existing uh, associations between the Hebrew letters and um, astrology. And then by associating the Kabbalah with the tarot, it's, you, you know, the Kabbalah becomes the central link between astrology and tarot. Within the context of the Kabbalah, the Golden Dawn's astrological and elemental associations probably make a great deal of sense. And I do agree with quite a few of the associations that they've made. Um, but the overall Kabbalistic structure that they're using is not the context that I am coming from. I don't really have an interest in Kabbalah, and I don't have any understanding of or connection with the symbols that they use to get at certain archetypes. The context that I'm coming from is Hellenistic astrology, which was itself influenced by the cultural practices and standards of the Hellenistic era in Greece. Um, I really like the structure and layered meaning that astrological associations can provide the tarot, but I want to structure these associations in a way that suits my preferred astrological standards, um, or just astrological tendencies, <laughs> whatever you want to, whatever you want to call it, which in my case is a Hellenistic approach to astrology rather than a Kabbalistic approach. Okay. So all of that is just to give an idea of the perspective that I'm coming from and the more fundamental reason that I want to make changes to the Golden Dawn associations in the first place. Um, so now let's actually just get into the changes I'm making. Uh, again, I'm not going to talk about any of the cards I'm not changing, uh, but right off the bat, one of the changes that I want to make is with the Fool. So we can jump right in. Um, so the Fool traditionally, and I'll, I'll say traditionally to mean the Golden Dawn, um, the Fool is associated with elemental air, or uh, sometimes it's associated with Uranus. Um, and Uranus is meant to represent eccentricity, creativity, sideways or unusual thinking, rebellion, freedom, and independence. And it's sort of meant to be similar to the rebirth and newness and, and like willingness to jump into things sides of the Fool. Um, elemental air is the breath of God in the beginnings of the universe. And so I imagine that's probably why it's associated with the Fool is that, you know, the Fool is, is sort of the the beginning of of everything, like the beginning of... Anyway, <laughs> um, I don't really like either of these associations. Uh, for starters, I don't like associating pure elements with major arcana cards. Like I said before, including all the planets and signs leaves you room for three elements and not four, and astrology uses four elements, and the difference would really annoy me. <laughs> um, but it's also because in astrology, the elements are meant to represent certain qualities that are shared by multiple signs. And so it would feel kind of weird to assign one card a quality that's meant to encompass three signs, because I feel like there would have to be some special connection between the element card and the cards associated with signs of that element. So if you, um, if you had, uh, okay, so for example, the Golden Dawn associates the Fool with air, and in the context of astrology, it would have a special relationship with the other air cards, which the Golden Dawn defines as Justice for Libra, the, stars, the Star for Aquarius, and the Lovers for Gemini. And so, although you can obviously make connections between the Fool and Justice, the Star, and the Lovers, I don't think that the Fool archetype has any particular qualities that would inherently encompass Justice, the Star, and the Lovers in particular. Like, there's no special quality that links it with those three cards over any other cards in the majors. Um, also, <laughs> um, if the Fool were Air, you would expect it to have some sort of strained relationship with the Earth cards, since Air and Earth are oppositions on a birth chart. Uh, the Golden Dawn Earth cards are the Devil for Capricorn, the Empress for Taurus, and the Hermit for Virgo. And again, although you can see how the Fool may have problems with some of these cards, I don't think it's by nature of those three cards being Earth cards that the Fool in particular would have some tension with them. 
uh, so basically, like, the TLDR or TLDL, whatever, didn't listen, is that it seems weird to associate the Fool with an element that defines its status as especially relevant to some cards over others. And, like, especially with the Fool, um, which has such a special place in the Major Arcana. As for associating it with Uranus, it's sort of an easy no for me because I prefer Hellenistic astrology, which includes the seven traditional planets, and Uranus is not one of them because it wasn't officially discovered until the 18th century. It has been integrated into modern astrology, but again, that's not a system that I really use a lot. Uh, but the other symbolic reason that I don't want to use it is because Uranus is an outer planet, and from an astrology perspective, it means it moves between the signs on a birth chart very slowly. Uranus stays in a sign for approximately 14 years, with a brief period in the middle where it retrogrades and changes signs for a few months. Um, but yeah, like, that's a really long time. <laughs> and outer planets are considered to be generational planets, because um, everyone within... A 14 year period, save a few months in the middle, are going to be born under the same sign because that planet is in that sign for such a long time. And so they, uh, the generational planets will express themselves differently on individual charts based on their house placement and their relationship with other uh, signs, or sorry, rather, uh, other planets. But they still have this sort of fixity as the sign is filtered through that planet for a really long period of time. Uh, the other generational planets are Jupiter and Saturn, and then if you use them, Neptune and Pluto, and any other bodies that will take a year-ish or longer to change signs. And that fixity doesn't make sense for the Fool to me, in the way that the fixity associated with Jupiter makes sense for the Wheel of Fortune. Um... Okay, <laughs> I, I was about to launch into a whole thing about it, but I'm not going to talk about it. We're going to focus on the ones I'm changing. Uh, the point is that the Fool feels fluid in a way that gener generational planets don't, and so I don't really want to associate it with Uranus anyway. Um, I think that like the central problem when trying to pick a particular thing to associate with the Fool is that the Fool is different from all the other cards. It is numerical zero. It has a special place in the tarot that's positioned outside of any defined traits or characteristics. Um, but the planets are meant to represent different parts of the psyche. And I don't see the fool as representing a specific part of the psyche or even a particular tendency. So it feels kind of strange to associate it with any one individual planet. Um, and the Fool has this sort of blank slate emptiness by nature and by its position in the tarot that I don't think fits very well with any of the planets or any of the signs or really like anything in particular. <laughs> so um, the association that I prefer with the Fool admittedly has more to do with philosophy than astrology. Like it is not an astrological body <laughs> or a sign or anything like that. Um, but philosophy is really important <laughs> for me. And philosophy forms the underpinnings of basically all knowledge and systems of understanding, and astrology is no exception to that. And so especially for the Fool, which has this special place as separate and, in a way, foundational to the major arcana, I think that utilizing a philosophical concept as its association is appropriate for that, um, just to sort of um, signify its, its uh, special place. So, so I'm doing that. <laughs> and basically my association with the Fool is nothing. <laughs> and I mean that as nothing with a capital N, or as I prefer to refer to it, null, just for clarity. Um, there are a lot of words used to describe similar concepts of nothingness, of philosophical nothingness, or similar words that are used to describe unrelated concepts. Um, the concept that I am trying to describe with null is the philosophical idea of essential emptiness. And the idea at its core is a metaphysical one, but there are a lot of components or applications, and I think you can consider and utilize a lot of them without having to devote yourself to a particular metaphysical worldview. Um, so the idea of null is essentially that every form that something takes is an illusion, in the sense that everything is nothing. We sense things in different forms, everything from 
objects to plants to actions to ourselves, like whatever we, we, we sense seems to have a particular form um, or a particular identity that makes it distinct from everything around it. So I am distinct from this tarot card and distinct from my laptop and distinct, distinct from this glass of water. Like there's these sort of concepts of, of essential identities where everything is different from each other. Um, and <laughs> the, idea of null is that these senses are illusory and there is actually nothing. Uh, you, so like everything is, is nothing. <laughs> we are the same because we are all nothing. <laughs> um, you might've heard of monism, which is the idea that everything is part of the same singular thing. Like everything in the universe is a part of the one. Uh, this is how some people will describe God as the source, as like the central one thing that everything is. Null is kind of similar, but rather than everything being one thing, everything is no thing. Everything is nothing. <laughs> um, that's the metaphysical side of it, and it can be a little hard to conceptualize, let alone get really on board with. Um, but a lot of the ethics and lessons and concepts that you can derive from the metaphysical null are really familiar to those of us who know the fool. From null, you get the idea of not being bound by particular attachments, whether worldly attachments or attachments to certain beliefs or presumptions about the world. Um, there's a classic Zen koan in which a Zen master points out that when you are full of preconceived ideas, you can't learn anything new. Uh, much like how when a teacup is full, you can't put any more tea into it. So you first must empty your cup. And the fool definitely represents this, being someone who is detached from the self and any pre-existing reason. They are ready to learn and ready to have experiences with no preconceived notions. So the fool has an empty teacup. Um, the fool is also embodying kind of the result of this detachment, which is this carefree attitude. Um, this There's sort of a sense of happiness and humor and overall peacefulness that comes from having no worries derived from particular viewpoints. Um, and this feeling is sort of the purpose of detachment. In Buddhism, it's akin kind of to the attainment of enlightenment. And in Epicureanism, it's the attainment of ataraxia or equanimity. And uh, there's an Epicurean saying <laughs> that was carved on the headstones of Epicureans that I like a lot. And I really think it captures the spirit of the fool. And it was, uh, non fui, fui, non sum, non curo. And that translates to, I was not, I was, I am not, I do not care. <laughs> and, and I think that's totally appropriate as an association for the fool. And, um, yeah, it, this this carefree attitude that is derived from uh, detachment, in and the detachment can be cultivated in knowing that um, everything is nothing and and our senses are are illusory in a sense. Anyway, so uh, that's what I like as an association for the fool, and it will end up making for a nice little connection with. Um, my association for the world, which we will get to. Um, Next up, Magician is associated with Mercury. I like that. I'm leaving it alone. High Priestess. I am changing this one as well. Uh, the High Priestess is traditionally associated with the moon, which is sort of getting at the intuition and the subconscious and sensitivity of the High Priestess. And I don't especially mind that. Um, but... To be perfectly honest, it has always bothered me that the moon isn't associated with the moon card. Um, especially when there doesn't seem like a strong symbolic reason for it not to be associated with the moon card. Um, and because the sun is associated with the sun card. And uh, frankly, I think that my association makes for some really beautiful symbolism and connections with other cards. Uh, so I prefer to associate the High Priestess card with Venus. And to be honest, at first, I sort of struggled with this association, not in that I think it didn't work, but I wasn't sure that if it would work better than the moon card. And I was really worried that I was just trying to force my own system to work. But the more I thought about it, the more reasons I feel like Venus actually makes for a really excellent association with the high priestess. 
Um, Venus is often sort of reduced to being simply the planet of love and beauty. And I think part of the reason I was hesitant is because those aren't the very first things that pop into mind when considering the high priestess. But there is so much more to Venus than that. And in some ways, I think that mirrors the high priestess themselves in that there's this deeper understanding of more than just the easy surface level stuff. Um, So a few things about Venus in Hellenistic astrology. Venus is considered a nocturnal planet, which I feel is appropriate for the high priestess to capture that nighttime depth and intensity. Uh, The planet itself is also best seen visibly in the sky in the twilight hours. And Venus is basically the strongest presence in the sky in the veil between night and day. And I think that makes a lot of sense for the high priestess since they are basically the guardian of knowledge between worlds and kind of have this foot on both sides of the veil. Uh, Venus was referred to as phosphorus or Hesperus, depending on the time of day. That's kind of a long story. It's sort of a philosophy joke. Um, But phosphorus means light bringer. And I think that's really significant in that it recalls bringing a light of awareness into the depths of the subconscious or the unconscious. So it's sort of like what you would find in the hermit. And that's definitely what the high priestess does too. So I like how Venus recalls that depth of knowledge that you hold within and this sense of self-knowledge and self self um, exploration. And there's also a really interesting connection that I hadn't known about until I heard it on the astrology podcast, where the host was highlighting a connection made by astrologer Shu Yap, and the connection is between Venus's astronomical cycle and the Sumerian story of the goddess Inanna's descent into the underworld. (laughs) And so basically, I'll try to summarize this super quickly, Uh, the timeline and the themes in the story sync up really perfectly with the cycle of Venus around the sun and the times when we can't see it in the sky and how long it stays in each position. And the story of Inanna involves her descent into the underworld to confront her sister. And of course, the descent is symbolically similar to the idea of diving into yourself for knowledge and awareness. And Inanna's story also reminds me a lot of the myth of Persephone (laughs) being kidnapped and taken to the underworld for the winter, and essentially having a foot in both worlds of the the underworld and the overworld. Um, And Persephone already has a really strong association with the High Priestess card. And so Inanna's myth I feel like just connects it to Venus in this really beautiful way and also in this really well-structured astronomical way, which is really interesting. Um, Of course, Venus is indeed also about love and beauty and desire. And Persephone's myth, um, which I've, I've always felt like there's a pretty strong association. I mean, you have the pomegranates right here in the card and also um, the mythic tarot, makes a really good association. I I don't think it's an uncommon association, Persephone with the High Priestess. But anyway, that's sort of where I really solidified the connection in my mind. Um, Persephone's myth made me realize that the symbolism is of Venus and the symbolism of love and beauty and desire is already a part of the High Priestess card with the frequent appearance of the pomegranate, which itself is, of course, associated with love and sex and desire. And so that Venusian passion is kind of already there in the card, even if we don't often emphasize it. Um, And another reason that I really like Venus with the High Priestess card is I feel like it makes such a nice connection with the Magician card, which is Mercury. Um, The Magician and the High Priestess are often presented as a pair, as, as sort of the first meeting that the fool has with the other, like anything other than themselves. And the magician and the high priestess are generally considered to be in harmony in that they are complementing and balancing each other. And one really cool thing in astrology is that in a birth chart, Mercury, or, or not even just a birth chart, in any chart, Mercury and Venus will always be in a harmonious relationship with each other. <laughs> always. And that is because planets will have a conflicting relationship if they are arranged in a square um, that is at like a 90 degree angle or in opposition with each other on a chart, meaning that they are directly opposite each other. Four, so it's like a 180 degree angle-ish. 
So for planets to be in a square, they need to be at least four signs apart from each other because um, that's how you that's how you can get a square. <laughs> like that's that's how you can get the geometrical square. Um, but Mercury and Venus can never be more than three signs apart from each other because they will both always be close in signs to the sun. So Mercury will never be more than one sign away from the sun, and Venus will never be more than two signs away from the sun. And you can kind of think of that as like an easy way to remember is that, well, Mercury is the first planet and it's the fastest, or, you know, it's a, it's the closest to the sun. And so it's always going to be relatively, it's going to appear um, within one sign on a chart. And so the same thing with Venus, it's the second from the sun. And so it will always appear within two signs relatively close to the sun on a chart. Um, so because Mercury and Venus can never be that far apart from each other, they will always have a harmonious relationship on a chart. And so I really like how associating the high priestess with Venus represents that harmonious relationship with the magician and sort of gives this lends the support to the pairing of the two, which I just, I just like, I just think that's really cool. <laughs> um, and yeah, so the last thing that really um, comes to mind, I guess, for Venus and the High Priestess is that I like how Venus brings a bit of youthful energy to the High Priestess. And I so often default to seeing the High Priestess as very serious or sorrowful. Um, and I don't think that's entirely accurate. I think that there really is this power and beauty and appreciation in valuing yourself and your intuition. And I like how Venus lends this to the High Priestess. Um, because like I was saying, I feel High Priestess is in a way meant to be the counterpart to the Magician. It makes more sense to me that they would share this kind of youthful, lighter attitude. Um, they have certainly more wisdom than the Fool, but it kind of also recalls the idea that the wise have a sense of humor because they don't need to take anything too seriously. Like they've kind of learned beyond certain attachments that feel all encompassing. And so they're able to approach things in a more lighthearted way. Um, and I think that Venus just represents the sensitivity and awareness that the high priestess has, but it also brings in the beauty and happiness and harmony that can come from living in line with your intuition and recognizing your personal power. So, <laughs> High Priestess Venus really liked that comparison. And so, because the Empress is traditionally associated with Venus, we're going to have to change her. <laughs> um, so, we talked a lot about the possible significations of Venus, um, but I think that the reason it's usually associated with the Empress in particular is for the sense of beauty and refinement and physical pleasures. Uh, Venus is the ruler of Taurus and Libra, um, and Taurus is supposed to represent the earthiness and appreciation of simple sensual pleasures, not in a sexual way necessarily, but things that feel good to our senses. Um, and I think this is how Venus is supposed to bring in the the earthiness to the association with the Empress card. My problem <laughs> is that although Venus rules Taurus, I think that there is a lot of mystery and liminality to Venus, like I was talking about Venus being sort of associated with the veil, that isn't totally appropriate for the Empress. And to be honest, Venus doesn't by itself really represent the strength and stability that the Empress does for me. Uh, Venus is a creative force, definitely, but it feels too dreamy for the Empress in a way. Um, it's like there's there's a lot more to the archetype of Venus than the elements of the archetypes it rules over. And Venus has a central meaning that links Libra and Taurus. And that central meaning doesn't feel like the same thing as, as the Empress. <laughs> I can't think of a better way to explain this. But since I'm using the High Priestess as Venus anyway, then it doesn't really matter. And I have something that I think suits the Empress even better. And so my preference for an association with the Empress is Earth. Not elemental Earth, but the Earth itself. <laughs> so, first off, Earth is not used in astrology as such. <laughs> um, that is, that the Earth doesn't appear on a birth chart. Obviously, it can't, because the birth chart is turning the sky. 
But the Earth is also, in a way, the most central feature of a birth chart because everything is built around our perspective of being on the Earth. And so the Earth supports and essentially creates the entire birth chart. Um, I don't happen to use an unequal house system like Placidus, um, like a, a house system where the houses are different sizes from each other, depending on where you were born, instead of each being exactly 30 degrees. But a lot of people do use unequal house systems, and that has a significant effect on your birth chart, um, especially the closer to the poles that someone was born, because that means that the sizes of the houses are going to be a lot more um, different from each other and a lot more uh, dramatic. So your placement on the Earth itself when you're born or at whatever time that you're doing your chart for uh, definitely can have a huge impact on the chart. And even if you don't use an unequal house system, there's just kind of this wisdom that where you were born and where you live definitely has a great impact on your life and on you as a person. Um, we have so much symbolism and meaning and relationship with the Earth that it has always felt kind of strange to me to not talk about it at all when considering astrology. So that's kind of my big reason why I think it's okay to include the Earth in astrological symbolism, even if it's not technically considered to be an astrological planet. Um, so I feel like it's probably pretty obvious why I'd want to associate the Empress with the Earth. I think that the Empress's association with Venus is kind of getting at a lot of similar things anyway, uh, which makes sense because Venus is our sister planet. But if you talk about the Earth in particular, you are talking about our absolute foundation, our mother, our mother Earth. It is a very familiar and familial connection, uh, which definitely suits the meaning of the Empress as a comforting force that still offers structure and foundation. And that familial connection with Venus... Uh, it also kind of reminds me of Persephone and Demeter, <laughs> and I've always liked that connection between the Empress and the High Priestess, and uh, with the Empress as being Demeter. So that's also just like a nice little mythological bonus. <laughs> um, Earth is the planet in our solar system with the most abundant life, obviously, <laughs> and we can consider the Earth to, as sort of the ultimate creator, as it has in a way both created life and allowed life to create itself. And so I think the association with Earth definitely captures the creation aspects of the Empress. Um, and it is also beautiful. The Earth and its creations are absolutely beautiful, but it's not focused so much on the intellectual beauty with a capital B as Venus is. It's more like the Earth is beautiful because creation and creativity itself is beautiful. Uh, so the purpose isn't to create beauty, but simply to create. And the beauty comes from how it makes you feel in a very basic, sensational kind of way, like the pleasure that it gives your senses. Um, and so I think that, plus the Earth uh, representing both hard work and abundance like the Empress brings about, I think that these make a lot of sense for associating the Earth with the Empress. Um, honestly, I could probably go on about this for a while, but I think that it's pretty easy to see the connection between the Empress and the Earth. Um, it feels like this is kind of always what the Empress was meant to be, that the Empress and the Earth and Mother Earth are kind of the same archetype or essence or, or however you want to call it. So yeah, that works for me. And now we've got kind of a few to go through here without many changes. We have the Emperor as Ares, which, yep, I'm on board with that. The Hierophant as Taurus, I'm good with that. The Lovers as Gemini, good with me. The Chariot as Cancer, good with me. Strength as Leo, good with me. Hermit as Virgo. The Wheel of Fortune as Jupiter. And Justice as Libra. And now we get to the Hanged Man, which is our next change. So, um, traditionally, Hanged Man is associated with either Elemental Water or Neptune. Um... Its association with Neptune is meant to represent dreams and illusions and mysticism and confusion, but also a transcendent awareness and revolutionary clarity. Whereas the association, the association with elemental water, um, I have honestly kind of a harder time seeing where the Kabbalistic associations 
work, like what they have to do with the hanged man. Um, the idea in uh, the Kabbalah is that water is a thing which formed the earth. Um, I can kind of see a connection if you're considering water, it, like elemental water in a general Western sense, like the idea of flowing and the swirling depths of the unconscious. But I don't really know how it fits in with the Kabbalah. But it doesn't really matter anyway, because I'm changing it. <laughs> so some of my other problems is, as I've said before in discussing The Fool, I don't like associating cards with pure elements, and I don't really use Neptune in my own astrology, so it's definitely a change for me. Um, but in this case, I think that the change is very simple and still really fits perfectly with associations for Neptune, uh, in that I am changing the Hanged Man to Pisces. <laughs> And Pisces basically already represents all of the things that Neptune represents. It is about dreaming and magic and playfulness, but also wisdom, um, illusions, and a depth of awareness. I'm going to take a little sip of water here, all this water talk. Okay. So Pisces is the mutable water sign. So by being mutable and water, it has this double dose of flexibility and flowing and both slowly changing and the ability to have this sense of depth. Uh, seasonally, it is about preparing for the change of seasons as it is the last sign in winter and it's preparing for spring. And the thing about preparing for spring in particular, about things very slowly starting to perk up and everything about to burst forth and be dramatically transformed by the spring... I think that makes a lot of sense as the hanged man becoming enlightened and preparing for the dramatic transformation brought on by death, which is the following card. Um, Pisces is also at the end of the zodiac, so there's this sense of conclusion and enlightenment at having moved through all the previous signs. In Hellenistic astrology, there's this idea that each sign develops on the sign before it by introducing something new. So it's sort of similar to the fool's journey in tarot, um, moving through the Zodiac. And so by this point in the Zodiac, there have been, there's been a lot that's happened. There's been a lot of change and a lot of enlightenment. And as a result of that, um, you have this heightened awareness and sensitivity and illumination of Pisces as the last Zodiac sign. And I think that's obviously super appropriate for the Hanged Man. Um, and something that I just kind of realized is that the Hanged Man is card 12 and Pisces is the 12th sign. Which is another cute little pretty pretty thing, and I'm sure that there's like a a cool numerical number symbolism that they share as a result. I don't know a ton about that, but it's it's interesting. I bet you could do something cool with that. Anyway, um so Pisces also rules the ninth house in astrology. And I haven't talked a ton about houses, but one thing that I think is a benefit of having Pisces as the association for the Hanged Man as opposed to Neptune is that it brings in elements of the Ninth House, um, since Pisces is the ruler of the Ninth House, and it doesn't really have anything to do with Neptune. Um, it's the house of exploration and thinking and knowledge gaining, which I think brings in these ideas of expansion of mind in a really interesting way, as opposed to just pure Neptune. Uh, and yeah. Uh, so Pisces is ruled by Jupiter in Hellenistic astrology, which is the embiggening planet. It lends this idea of expansion, uh, expansion of mind and awareness, and I think that the Hanged Man is about that in a lot of ways, that this new perspective leads to an expansion of mind and an awareness of yourself in the world that you can't get from the rationality of justice alone. Um... And interestingly, you'll also see that there's sort of a connection with Mercury in that Mercury is in detriment and in fall in Pisces, which basically means that Pisces has a really, really hard time expressing itself through Mercury. And I think this shows again how it's not about rational thinking or the methodology or the sense of control that you get from Mercury. And like when we when we look at the magician, that's something that we see a lot is that the magician has this sense of control and mastery over over the elements so they, they're like they're in control of something and so it kind of makes sense that um pisces wouldn't really be able to express itself through this means of control it's rather about the lack of control that uh 
the sort of acceptance of, of lack of control that leads to the enlightenment of the hanged man, which I think is, is obviously very appropriate for it. Um, and one more interesting little connection is that uh, Pisces is a sign of duality, being the two fishes swimming back and forth to maintain a constantly shifting balance. And I think that you can see a story of duality in the middle of the tarot from the Wheel of Fortune, let's see if I can lay this out, to Temperance. So, up to the point of the Wheel of Fortune, everything has been very practical or personal in some way. Like, when you meet the new figures from the magician to the lovers, and then you take their influence and develop your own insight and strength from the chariot to the hermit, all of that has been very um, close up close and personal. And the Wheel of Fortune then comes in and throws this big old wrench into everything. Whether it's good or bad, it's just introducing something really new and dramatic and forcing you to adapt in some way. And justice then is sort of the evaluation, like the mental, rational evaluation of the thing that's introduced by the Wheel of Fortune and trying to decide rationally how to best integrate this new thing or, or what to do with it. Um, then you have the hanged man who, after having categorized or, or decided what to do with this new thing rationally, is both living the consequences of their decision and simultaneously becoming more fully aware of what's been introduced by, by living it and by recognizing things that are outside of their rational control. And so death follows that as the dramatic change or progression that happens after the new insight, and temperance is the more intentional integration of the new, um, like the true mixing of the new, instead of just trying to balance the old and new. Uh, so I think among these five cards, you sort of have this story of duality of like the old and the new and going from trying to balance them to truly integrating them. And um, in the middle, right here in the middle, is the hanged man who has a pure awareness of the two aspects on a personal level. And that's the same sort of duality that Pisces represents, uh, is this awareness on a personal level. So, yeah, I really like pairing uh, Pisces with the hanged man. Okay, I'm gonna get back organized here. Thanks for hanging in with me on on this very long video. I am having tons of fun with it. So, okay. Next up is uh, Death, which is associated with Scorpio, which is fine. Temperance, Sagittarius, which is fine. Devil, Capricorn, fine. Star, or oh, the uh, Tower and Mars, which is fine. Uh, the Star and Aquarius, which is fine. And then we get to the Moon, which obviously can't be associated with Pisces anymore, which is the tradi traditional association. So um, we gotta change it. And I've already talked about Pisces a bit for the Hanged Man. Um, I think the aspect of Pisces that are supposed to be associated with the Moon in particular are uh, like the Moon. The Moon is Pisces, the moon is meant to focus on the depth and the dreamy, imaginative qualities of Pisces. And the thing that I don't totally like about it is that Pisces, to me, doesn't fully capture the power and fear and just lunacy and weirdness of the moon. And honestly, like, why isn't the moon card associated with the moon? Seriously. And so, um... My obviously, like my preferred preference with the moon card is the moon. The thing is, this took me a really long time to figure out if this would actually be an appropriate association because I was thinking really hard about it, and it just didn't make a lot of sense to me why it wasn't already associated with it. So it's like there's got to be something that's missing. Like, does this association actually make sense, or am I just wanting the moon to be associated with the moon because I want it? <laughs> um, and it was not helped by the fact that I don't always have a super clear understanding of the moon card in general. Which is kind of funny, because I think that's kind of appropriate for the mystery of the moon card anyway. So it was really helpful for me, I mentioned it slightly before, was the Astrology po Podcast, and um, there are episodes 
uh, there's like a whole series of episodes that deep dives in each of the planets and it is seriously like two to three hours for each one and they barely scratch the surface of it but it was really really helpful in understanding the moon better astrologically and the moon card itself so um, I will post a link below and I just wanted to give credit and say that a lot of these sort of symbolic top hits <laughs> were very heavily inspired by that video okay more water okay we'll get into it <laughs> so Part of my concern was how the moon is usually associated with nurturing, and that's an aspect of the moon card that I didn't entirely see. I hear nurturing and I think the empress or maybe the star, um, but there are ways that the moon card is nurturing, and it's because it's sort of a period of gestation between the uh, hope of the star and then this explosion of self and self-confidence in the sun and the moon is the card in between that gives you the quiet to really explore things explore your fears and become more confident um thanks to this renewed hope so yeah and in astrology the moon can be associated with gestation and nurturing growth um and I guess I sort of see that as like the dark is scary sometimes, but it's also comforting in how it helps us sleep. And there are a lot of things that seem like contradictions in the moon and in the moon card. Um, there's sort of this question of how much you can trust your senses. There's this fear, but also calm. There's this haziness of uh, nighttime, but also excitement and lunacy and freedom to see things in a different way. Um, it's symbolic of seeing beauty in darkness, which is not where we usually see it. Um, the moon is unstable in the sense that it moves very quickly in an astrological sense, sense through the signs, and it has a lot of different phases. But it is also rhythmic and balanced because the motions are consistent. And it's sort of like how rocking, like, back and forth can lull you to sleep even though you're moving, and you would think that moving would stir your energy. Um, the moon also appears to be producing light, but we know that it's only reflecting light. So it's another instance of the moon not being what it seems. And so I think that all of these contradictions are present in the moon card and are also appropriate for, for the moon itself as an astrological, as the symbolism for an astrological body. Um, the moon is also astrologically associated with the past and with your roots. Uh, there's sort of an idea that the moon is your, your moon sign is your sun sign from your previous life. And I think that this sense of your roots and your past is very similar to the moon cards ideas of really getting at the depths of your soul. <laughs> um, and like, there's, there's so much more to talk about the moon, of course, but I'll just like really quickly highlight some symbols that I think are easily shared between the moon astrologically and the moon card. Eclipses are associated with the moon and are a really strong and dramatic thing in a birth chart or any chart. And of course, an eclipse is featured here on the RD, RWS deck. And it's something that was a scary interruption in the natural order or, or the typical balance of things, which contributes to the ideas of fear and lunacy that can be in the moon card. Uh, the moon has its joy in the third house, and so it has associations with travel and wandering. And I think that sort of loose explorative travel fear feels uh, very right for the moon card. Uh, and the moon is also a receptor, gathering and receiving things, and this allows you to gain what you need to solidify your sense of self from the sun. And then, of course, in modern astrology, you've got associations with the Jungian unconscious and sleep and dreams and instincts and a lot of stuff that's very present in the moon card. So, yes, after much convincing, I do think that it makes sense to associate the moon with the moon card. And I kind of can't believe that it tripped me up this much. But, you know, you can't. no one can say that I wasn't absolutely thorough. <laughs> so, the sun, the sun fine association by me. And now um, <laughs> you may have figured out by a process of elimination that the last two cards that I want to change are judgment and the world. So um, judgment is traditionally associated with elemental fire. 
and sometimes associated with Pluto. Uh, Pluto is sort of about transformation and perspective and dramatic shifts. And the elemental fire is the fire that formed heaven. Um, again, I kind of don't see a lot of a lot of where where the Kabbalistic association works in particular. Um, and the funny thing is, like, although the elemental fire may be seen as a good thing or may be seen as in, as a different thing in the Kabbalah, it kind of takes on a whole other meaning when we see it in the context of modern Christianity. Because when you say afterlife or judgment and fire, you think hell and not heaven. <laughs> so that can definitely give this card a different tone. Um, okay, so my um, preference is associating judgment with Saturn. And I've got to say it right now that I have never felt like Saturn makes a lot of sense for the world card. Saturn is traditionally associated with the world card. And I don't get it. <laughs> maybe it's kind of the conception of the world card. Maybe maybe like the reason it's associated with the world card is that the conception of the world card has changed over time. Um, but so many of the associations with Saturn seem so cold and restrictive for the world which i think is a very expressive here i'll just flip it over the world is such an expressive and jubilant card um i mean the word jubilant is derived from joy <laughs> like shouting for joy and that is so clearly more jupiterian than saturnine and so for me i've always felt like hey judgment is right here next to the world card just like move saturn over to the judgment card <laughs> so that's exactly what i've done and basically all the reasons that I think Saturn works for the Judgment card are the same reasons that I think it doesn't work for the World card. So, for starters, the glyph of Saturn is a scythe beneath a cross, the scythe being representative of reaping what you've sown, with it, which is the core meaning of the Judgment card. Um, Saturn definitely has an awareness of reality, and especially the reality of difficulties and where you're being restricted. Um, I'd say that Saturn is a realist with a reputation for being a pessimist, <laughs> and that is definitely akin to judgment, too, um, in that judgment is showing you what's real, but a lot of people can sort of see that as showing you things you don't want to see. Um, Saturn is acutely aware of the consequences and the structures of things, and it kind of represents boundaries on a very large scale. Not only personal boundaries, or even just human-created structures like politics and law and ethics, but the ultimate boundary between life and death. Um, Saturn's associations with boundaries and life and death kind of makes sense if you remember that Saturn is the last of the planets that's always visible with the naked eye, so it essentially acts as the boundary between our local system and the rest of the universe. <laughs> and so this associates it with reaching the end of things, like um, the end of the end of our solar system. And it's sort of just like death or the end of time in general. And that's really what judgment is. Um, I mentioned this in my zine on judgment, but in the earliest decks that feature it, judgment is the final triumph in that it triumphs over all else. It triumphs over time and fame and all human constructs because it is the end it is eternity and i think this is very appropriate for saturn as the end of the planets in hellenistic astrology um saturn's rings also signify this boundary or structure as well um which i think is neat okay saturn is the slowest moving planet in hellenistic astrology with a cycle of about 29 years compared to jupiter's 12 year cycle and the slowness of Saturn often associates it with patience and unavoidability. Saturn is not flighty or youthful or excited in any way, like you might see with the magician as Mercury, for example. Um, it is solid and slow and forces you to become aware of things and not avoid them. And that's what judgment does. Saturn rules Capricorn and Aquarius, which makes a lot of sense seasonally. Capricorn and Aquarius are the strongest winter signs, which signify the death of things and the end of the year, which is another association with endings, just like judgment. Saturn is also exalted in Libra, 
and exaltation basically means that Saturn is like an honored guest while in Libra, and Libra is able to fully express itself and is excited to express itself through Saturn. Um, and this makes a lot of sense with Libra being associated with justice and Saturn with judgment, because judgment is very similar to the justice card, but on an even larger scale and completely unavoidable. And so it makes sense that's what the justice card would want and appreciate, is this large scale um, justice, basically. And Saturn also has its fall in Aries, which is basically the opposite of exaltation, which, in that I mean, not exactly, but but basically it's that it has difficulty expressing itself through... Uh, Aries has difficulty expressing itself through Saturn, which kind of makes sense because um, Aries is is very fiery and progressive and, and like wants to push things forward, and, and Saturn doesn't want that. Um, which also makes a lot of sense when you compare Judgment with the Emperor as Aries, because the Emperor is very much about imposing their own will and being out there doing things and pushing things forward and creating their own structures which are centered around their own individual will. And so it makes sense that it wouldn't be so keen on the Judgment card and actually having to have patience and face the consequences of these actions and operate within these inextricable boundaries of of time and space. <laughs> um, and again, like, I could go on and on and on about Saturn, but like the one last thing that I want to mention is that Saturn is also about marginalization. And sometimes that's the thing that does the marginalizing through creating boundaries where there don't need to be boundaries, but also in its patience and acute awareness of the structures that we impose and how they might be harmful. Uh, Saturn is the ruler of Capricorn. And if you think of the devil card, then you will totally see what I'm talking about regarding structures and boundaries. Uh, but it's also the ruler of Aquarius, which is the star. And it's about hope and change and unusual thinking. And I think it's precisely Saturn's patience and slowness that allows it to do so, to have this awareness um, to to change structures and to um, unmarginalize. <laughs> I don't know how else to say that, but like um, it, Saturn is realistic, and so it can see what needs to change. And I'm still kind of trying to grapple with truly understanding Saturn and how it fits in with Aquarius. But from a tarot perspective, I can basically see how judgment is like a combination of the devil and the star. In that judgment is not just a negative card and it's not just about boundaries. It's also about liberation and freedom given by being able to see things as they really are. So yeah, I think Saturn just makes infinitely more sense being associated with judgment than the world. And so now, of course, we have to assign something new for the world. And, you know, I really don't understand why Saturn was associated with the world in the first place. I think the most convincing thing I've heard about is something about the fixed signs um, and, like, fixity and unchangingness or something but really Aquarius is the only one ruled by Saturn anyway and Aquarius changes things <laughs> but like anyway beyond that it just doesn't really make sense to me so I think that the central problems with associating the Saturn with the world is that it, it sort of boils down to two major things one is that Saturn is a malefic planet um as opposed to a benefic planet and so no matter how much you transform that to be helpful, it is still at its base a challenging planet. And I think that by the time you've reached the world, you're sort of beyond these challenges. Um, and two, Saturn is about restriction, and the world is about expansion. Not in a growth sense necessarily, but in the sense that everything opens up. So to me, it makes sense that the world should be the thing after Saturn. It's the thing beyond the end, because it is everything. It is all the things that we can't see beyond Saturn. Um, so if you can remember way back when we were talking about the Fool, I associated the Fool with the Null. And for the world, we basically have the alternative to that, or perhaps the complement, which is the All. <laughs> and um, as a pair, the Fool and the world represent the basic duality of nothing versus something. The metaphysical nothing versus the metaphysical everything. The world kind of sums up everything that came before it, and it is the combination of all things. 
And in between the fool and the world is the summation of the human experience through the archetypes. And the human experience is something somewhere in between nothing and everything. So the idea of the all as I'm using it is the sum of all being, both potential being and actual being. Uh, it's sometimes called the metaphysical absolute or the first metaphysical being or God or the unity of all things. Um, there are so many philosophical concepts that utilize or expand on this in various ways, and they are all really fascinating and each deserve their own courses dedicated to them. So I can't get into it all right now. But the basic idea is that the all is everything. It really is the world, in, as in our world, our universe, and all that ever was or will be. So, one philosophical concept that has been really grabbing me lately, and the reason that I really like the idea of the all in an approach to tarot, is the idea of metaphysical eternalism. So, ba the basic motto of eternalism is everything all at once. And the idea is that time doesn't exist as we perceive it, as a flow with a particular direction from past to future and a set rate of one second per second. Instead, all moments of time, both past, future, and present, are static and exist simultaneously, just as particles of matter or space exist. Or you could say that time doesn't exist at all. Um, and it's just how we move through space. And uh, basically, it's the idea that everything, everything already exists. Everything exists all at once. And it's just a limitation of our brains that causes us to typically perceive time as having a flow and a rate, because we can only perceive one moment or one present at a time. Um, so it's sort of like how our eyes can only perceive certain colors and our ears can only perceive certain frequencies, even though we can prove that other colors and other frequencies exist. And so this is a really interesting concept that obviously has a lot of metaphysical implications, but what has really piqued my interest is how it might be used to explain divination. And on this model, it could be that the act of divination is us trying to trick our minds into observing other presents that exist now on an eternalist viewpoint, but that we can't usually perceive. Anyway, um, the point of all this is that an eternalist universe is basically an extreme version, uh, like a metaphysical extreme version of everything that exists in that everything that ever has and ever will exist does currently exist. So I think it really is a lot like the world card in that an eternalist universe is really everything all at once. And this is kind of how I see the world card as everything. Every single possibility, every single moment in time and space. And frankly, I think that the presence of the fixed astrological signs kind of assists that viewpoint also of an eternalist, uni uh, an eternalist uh, universe as everything being, being fixed. Um, anyway, <laughs> I know that's a lot to think about, but even in a more simple, simple and practical sense, associating the all with the world means that the world sort of represents metaphysics itself and grand philosophies and exploration of questions beyond our knowledge, uh, which I think is perfectly fitting for the end and the summation of the major arcana. It is a suitably deep and grandiose ending for a suitably deep and grandiose thing such as the tarot. So, I hope that this has given you some food for thought, and I hope that you are encouraged to consider uh, some of these astrological associations to the, to, the, to the tarot, and maybe try your hand at constructing your own system of associations based on what's philosophically or astrologically important to you. Um, as I mentioned way back at the beginning, uh, <laughs> I will have a few links to things in the description. I think I'll also probably make a blog post, which I will link below with a, a simpler chart of my astrological tarot associations for reference later. Um, yeah, thank you for listening to this. It's been a very complex subject, and I've worked really hard to try and present it in a thorough way that's still reasonably accessible. Uh, so thanks for hanging out with me for 
over an hour now. <laughs> of course, let me know if you have any questions at all. And thank you very much for listening. Bye.